This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, Dr. Sofia Grimidi is the coordinator of the section of Greek and Roman Antiquity, CARA, at the National Hellenic Research Foundation. She studied history and archaeology at the University of Thessaloniki and obtained her PhD from the same university. Her research interests include the study of coinage of the provincial cities under the Roman rule, numismatic circulation in the Hellenistic Roman period through, this, through site, and coin, site finds and coin hoards, as well as coinage history institutions of Hellenistic Macedonia. Her research aims to use coins as a primary source for the study of history. Dr. Kremidi has published over 50 articles in collected volumes and research journals world, worldwide, accord, along with several books and monographs. Her 2018 monograph, The Autonomous Conages Under the Last Antigonids, won the Economomu Award of the Academy of Athens in 2020. Uh, she has participated to several international research projects, most notably the Roman Provincial Conage Project and the coin hordes of the Roman Empire. Uh, she has held several prestigious positions, among which the research director at the Col Pratique des Autes, des Autes Etudes sorry, in Paris, and was a visiting scholar at the Heberdian uh, Coin Room at the University of Oxford, and last but not least, she was a visiting scholar at the American Numismatic uh, uh, Society for the Summer Graduate Seminar. And among her numerous international awards, she's also the recipient of the ANS 2021 Huntington Award. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Kremidi among us. So thank you. Thank you for being with us, Sophia. Thank you very much, Lucia. Thank you very much for this kind uh, introduction, and thanks uh, to the uh, to all the members of the ANS for this um, invitation to give a long um, a talk in your series. So, what this talk is about is um, what coins with secure provenance can tell us about. So, coins with exact and secure provenance come from excavation contexts. In this case, we know not only the site, but in some cases, a precise building and perhaps even the stratigraphic zone where the cones were found. Other coins have a rather general regional province, and when they derive from local collections or are handed in by locals, so we know the general area they come from with quite uh, a degree of certainty, but we don't know their exact time spot. So the question is, why is this information important? Uh, so, coins with secure provenances offer two kinds of information. So, this talk will have, let's say, two um, two 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 um, parts. The second, the the first part concerns important archaeological and historical evidence concerning a certain site or city where the coins are found, and not actually the coins themselves. The second part contains information, numismatic evidence concerning the issuing authority or the function of certain issues that derives exactly from their find spots. So to address the first question, what archaeological evidence can provenance coins provide? I will just go through a few examples. So the site of Olynthos, this is a city in the Chalkidiki, northern Greece. Uh, it what must have been a coastal site at the period, as you can see it here in, uh, in red, started to be excavated um, by the uh, American school and um, uh, the Hopkins University in the 20s and the 30s. Today, we also have a research project going on there, a joint program of the Greek Ministry and Culture and the Michigan University. Well, this was an excavation that was quite um, meticulously published. And uh, amongst the publications, we also have the publication of the coins by, by Robinson, D.M. Robinson. So um, the coins actually that uh, were, 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 were discovered and were identified um, at Olynthos were prim primarily 
the bronze issues of the Chalcidian League. Now we know that Olynthos was this the, was the was the was, was the um, the center of the Chalcidian League from a fourth for, uh, from 432 up to 348 when the city was destroyed uh, by Philip II or at least partially destroyed and the league was uh, was dismantled. So the fact that um, Robinson um, found a an, an very, very large number of Chalcidian coins amongst the 1,000 identified coins found at Olynthus was a, a clear proof um, that the site he was excavating was actually Olynthus, the seat of the Chalcidian League. Because, you know, now we see uh, maps with names of ancient cities, but it's not always obvious how we can identify these cities. We in many very cases, we had very many cases, of course, like in the case of Olynthus, we had um, some textual information from Thucydides here who described the, the events of the Peloponnesian War in northern Greece. And so he gave some information about the, 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 the about the, 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 settle, the where the settlement was, but this is never really um, accurate enough. So when you have a general area and you find a large number of coins, then you have the identification of a city, which we all understand is a very, very important um, archaeological um, evidence. <clears throat> and the, the, the city of Olynthos is one of the cities that have been identified through coins. There are others. The coins in this case are, are used a little bit like decrees. So um, another type of evidence, another type of uh, sites that whose interest, whose coins are quite interesting to, to study are the sanctuaries for quite obvious reasons. And um, this is an example uh, of the coins I'm going to present here, uh, for the derived that were discovered in the sanctuary of, Neme uh, of the Zeus of Nemea, Nemean Zeus. You see over on the map at the, at the left, the bottom, Nemea is a city uh, in the Peloponnese, just north of Argos and south of Corinth, let's say to the west, southwest of Corinth. Nemea was not a city. Actually, it was never a city of its own. It was a sanctuary that was dependent on the on the neighboring cities. In the beginning, it was dependent from Cleone, and later it was dependent from Argos. We have quite a lot of uh, information about uh, the sanctuary of Nemea and the Nemean Games that took part there through um, through um, archaeological and historical sources, written, archaeological and written sources. So we have a very good context in which we can place the, the coins. We also know also from the sources and from the excavations that the, 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 the temple was destroyed during the Peloponnesian War. And then we have a new complex built under the Macedonians around the 330s. So this is the very, very general archeological landscape. Now at Nemea, we know very well through very many texts and inscriptions that we have the famous name in games taking place there, competitions, athletic and musical competitions uh, held in honor of Zeus. Uh, they, they, took, they, they, they took place every two years, exactly as the Isthmian Games. And already from the sixth century, uh, the games were open to all Greece. And the Nemean Games became one of the great, the Nemea became one of the great Panhellenic festivals. And it's interesting to see what we mean by Panhellenic festivals. Panhellenic festivals means festivals to which um, uh, um, citizens from all over the Greek world could participate. Not all festivals were Panhellenic festivals. The Isthmia, the Pythia were the Olympic, or were other Panhellenic festivals. And the Panathenia in Athens. So we have Athens, Delphi, uh, the Nemea, and Isthmi outside Corinth. So a group of archaeologists from the University of California, Ber Berkeley, began to work at Nemea in 1973 under the direction of Professor Stephen Miller and discovered the remains of a stadium on a hillside near the temple. The temple was, 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 um, 
was visible. It had never completely, it was visible throughout the centuries. Even we have 18th century here, like this one here, you see gravures that show that some of the, some of the, the columns were still, were still standing. But the stadium was not at all visible and it was excavated since 1973. And uh, after 1996, this is not 19, this is wrong, sorry. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry. Did I, did I lose the, the did you, can you see the, can you see the, the, the PowerPoint? No, it did oh. go away. No, yeah, I, sorry, I lost it. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll put I'll it on. this out of the YouTube recording. <laughs> Okay, you'll have to to do to do sort of. So where were we? We were here. So um, already from yeah, and so we have from uh, nineteen ninety six um, a revival of these games. So if you want to go and run in the mayor, you can do that, but you have to you have to register in April before April. So let me just check, change this one moment. So um, the coins of Nemea have been very, very meticulously published in an exemplary publication of uh, Robert Knapp and um, John McIsa. Sophia, um, do you actually uh, go back into presentation mode? Yes, yes, sorry. Sorry. I go back to presentation mode. Yeah, yes, yes, of course. So we have a very detailed publication um, of the coins of Nemea in a special monograph where uh, there is enormous archaeological information um, given uh, which um, concerning the coins and the, the, the way they were found, how they were found, what we can derive uh, from these finds. So if we look at this chart, if we look at this chart now who what the, generally shows the, um, the provenance of these coins, we can see that uh, the, the large, large majority of these coins um, come from the Peloponnese, we, and the, quite a few from central Greece, Attica, and Macedonia. So, um, And uh, then we have some coins, not many, but we do have coins from Egypt, Asia Minor, uh, Thessaly, Crete, and Italy, Italy Sicily, and Thrace. <clears throat> so we practically have coins from all over the Greek world. Well, we don't have any from the Black Sea, but from a very ra ra a large geographical range. However, as you can see also in the um, in, in the um, in this in the in the sketch in the, in, on the map to the right, um, you can see the the, the basic the, the largest concentration of coins is found at a at an um, at a distance of twenty five kilometers around Nemea. Whereas the, about the seventy five percent of the total coins are found at a distance of a hundred kilometers. So although these are Panhellenic games, we have a rather wide but however regional circulation. So how do we explain this? How do we explain the fact that uh, we have Panhellenic games, but we have coins, a few coins from Asia Minor, a few coins from Egypt, a few coins from Italy or Sicily, whatever. Um, I think we should think in two directions. The first direction is that Panhellenic games means mostly that uh, athletes can come from all over the Greek world and compete. Of course, visitors can also come and compete, but it's very logical that they would not come in the same numbers as visitors as we would have from the nearby regions. And the second thing that we need to keep in mind is that the sanctuary was um, was visited all the year, all around, uh, all the time. Not only during the one month or a few day, a few weeks every two years. So I think that quite well explains this predominance of the the regional coins. Um, now, um, as I said, they have done a very meticulous archaeological, um, the, the, the publishers and excavators, very meticulous um, archaeological um, publication and um, a very thorough investigation. And they have traced, this is the stadium, this is a, this is a sketch of the stadium, and um, this is the placement of the, the fine spots of the coins on the stadium. So, what 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 the publishers actually um, um, 
resumed is that there is a there is a tendency of of cities of coins of certain cities to be found in bulks in the same i mean for example here we have um can you see the cursor the, the cursor i'm showing you. yes okay so uh we see here for example that they have the um, there is a concentration of coins of Argos, for example, and here there is a concentration of coins of Sicyon. Coins of Corinth are all over the place because they were the most common coins and probably all the Peloponnesians used them. So they sort of, you know, um, they sort of um, uh, suggested that it's possible that these people came in groups and sat together in groups, So, which is a small detail, which I think is quite uh, amusing to know where people sat, I mean, so many years ago. And uh, if we compare to another sanctuary in Peloponnese, which is a sanctuary of Artemis Orthia, which is just outside Sparta, this is an ancient sanctuary of a goddess called Orthia originally, and was later in the in the in in, in the Roman times identified with Artemis, and it was also excavated. We had very few coins from the site, but. The number of coins is much smaller, as you can see there. We have over 1,000 coins here. We have something like 50 coins. But still, you see that here we have practically nothing that is outside the, Pelop outside the Peloponnese. The, the majority of the coins are uh, of Lacedaemon, uh, which means of the very, very, uh, of Sparta, actually, of the, the area, very, very close, the city very close. And the rest is Corinth, Sicyon, etc. We have... Ex Apart from one Ptolemaic coin, nothing comes outside the Peloponnese. So we can see that coin, coin finds can um, differentiate uh, the, uh, the picture we have from a Panhellenic sanctuary to a very local sanctuary. Another type of sites uh, which, um, to which coin, uh, coin, coin finds have um, um, uh, brought in important information is uh, military forts to 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 get a bit uh, to to get orientated on the map. This is a this is from the old publication. It's not a, a very good map, but you can see down here at the left that this is Attica. Okay, this is Attica. This is Athens. So the the the, the peninsula we're looking at is on the eastern coast, on the eastern coast of Attica. And this is the Gulf of Porto Rafti today. And this is the peninsula of Coroni. This is a very well um, protected harbor. It has this peninsula, it's a closed harbor. This peninsula, it has also these small islands. So it was an ideal place for a military fort or for a fleet to, to stand during, um, during warfare. It was protected both from the weather and from the enemies. So uh, this this fort, uh, th this peninsula was excavated again many years ago, and a fortress was discovered. So a fortress at, at this place cannot be a necropolis because there's no really city around here. So it can only be a military camp. And the coin finds uh, around this camp, also although they are few again, they are quite indicative and they're very helpful for understanding what this camp was. So out of the few coins we have, we have some coins of Athens, Mega and Negina, which are actually the local coins, which is something you would totally accept. But then you have 20 bronze coins of Ptolemy II, which is something which is certainly not um, uh, usual in, 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 uh, in Attica to find Ptolemaic coins in, in such a relatively large number. So this actual actual coin finds uh, offer confirmation that this was actually a Ptolemaic fort in Attica. Um, now Ptolemy II ruled uh, during the third quarter of the, the the second quarter, sorry, of the of the of the third century. This is exactly the period uh, of the Cremonidian War, which was the war between the Ptolemies and the Antigonids, or rather the allies of the Antigonids. Um, in, in mainland Greece. So Gonatas um, controlled Athens and controlled large parts of the Peloponnese and the Ptolemies are actually um, trying to, to get um, control of these possessions. We have this war and we know through sources that the Ptolemies uh, establish forts and cities and their fleet is 
uh, is 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 um, is navigating around Attica. So here we have a very concrete evidence of this um, of this fortification of these forts and of this military presence of the Ptolemaic navy in Attica. So these were just some examples concerning um, the um, uh, what coins can tell us about the cities of the sites where they are found and how important this information can be in some cases, like the identification of the city, of the range of visitors in a sanctuary, or, or the, the, the forces that occupied a certain military fort. This, I would say, could be equivalent to, to sort of evidence we can have through inscriptions in other cases. Now, if we go going to, to, to try and see what, um, what uh, provenances of coins can tell us concerning coinage of coins themselves, this is another aspect that we, we, can, we can discuss um, of the contribution of provenances. And I will show a couple of examples um, of this through my personal research. So this, as you can see here, is a, a coin. It's a silver coin, a tetra ball, a small silver denomination of about two and a half grams. This, this specific specimen is an ANS specimen. But I came through these coins uh, when a collector um, that from Northern Greece, who I knew had uh, his collection was was mostly formed from um, coins in the in the Kalkidiki, brought up an issue like this. And he said, look what I found in the area and what could this be? So I look at this coin um, and I'd never seen one before and uh, they're not very common coins. And um, well, I see this Arpa and the, with the club and the in the in the wreath on the reverse. And I know this is fine, the Kalkidiki. And I said, this must be some kind of Macedonian issue because as you can see on the left, the Arpa is very common on the coins on Philip V and Perseus after that. And the club is very, very common on the Antigonid coins of Philip V and Perseus. And we even have a small um, bronze denomin coin denomination, which I, I thought they don't have a photo here because it's very rare. But we have a, a small bronze coin of Philip V, which has exactly a combination of the Arpa and the, and the club. So I think this is some kind of Macedonian issue, but what is it? It's not a royal coin. It doesn't have it doesn't have an inscription. It's very rare for Hellenistic coins to have no inscriptions. This is clearly an Hellenistic coin, although the date has been much is not not very secure. It has been dated from the mid, from the end of the fourth century to the second century. So I'll go back to the date later, but. So my first impression was that, that this was must have been some kind of Macedonian, not royal, but perhaps a sanctuary in the area or something else. And then I start to look up the bibliography and try to find what is known for these coins. So then I see that these coins are already published. Uh, or they were already in the in a 19th century Greek collection. And they were published as coins of Argos. Now, why were they published as coins of Argos? Because, 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 I don't know, because the coins of Argos very often have, as you can see in the example below, um, an arpa as a symbol. This is a symbol. It's not exactly part of the type. It's a symbol. So because of the arpa, somebody said, and because perhaps of the denomination also, because we have these tetra balls very often at Argos. So um, this was attributed to Argos. So I start looking at all the excavation that the Peloponnese to look. Have we have any other? I said, okay, one coin from Macedonia. Well, it's not enough, of course. So I look around at the, all the the coin finds and the, the 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 publications I could find, and I don't find any coins from the Peloponnese um, of this type discovered and published. I I ask the excavators of Argos, because there is a project now publishing the, the excavation coins of Argos, I sent them a photo. I said, have you ever found such a coin at, the, at Argos? And they said, we have not found no such coin at Argos. So, I mean, the attribution to Argos does not now seem so certain. Um, uh, um, so I go back to the Macedonian scenario and um, I uh, suggest in an article 
uh, it was published a, a year ago in this volume, Andidoron, which was a volume we published at the Institute in, of Historical Studies in Athens in honor of the late Olivia Picard. So I published there an article and I suggest that this could be because the, the, um, the head on the obverse is obviously, um, although this was always identified as a head of a nymph, it's certainly not a head of a nymph. It's a, it's a head of an archi archising head of Apollo. It does not have a laurel wreath, but we do have um, Apollo Apollo um, heads without a laurel wreath, so sort of archise, archising Apollo type of Apollo, but it is Apollo. So I suggest that this could be um, 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 uh, a small issue of the tyrant Apollodoros, who held uh, uh, Cassandria, he held Cassandria for a certain period before Antigonus Gonatas managed to um, to to conquer uh, to conquer Cassandria and uh, and and, and uh, actually Cassandra is a, a city in the Helgiviki and actually incorporated it into his into his kingdom. Of course, this is not a secure, absolutely secure. It's an hypothesis, uh, and I do not present it as a certainty. Um, but it what what I want to show here it actually is that in some cases provenance is extremely important for the identification of the mint of a coin where we don't have other evidence. And another similar example um, is a colonial coin. This is um, a coin uh, dated to the time of Tiberius, certainly. Um, we have other coins with the same reverse and the head of Tiberius on the obverse. It's clearly copying a Roman, uh, a Roman type. The head of Pietas is is very common on on Roman on Roman coins, and it's a, an exact copy actually of these. And on the reverse, it has the name of a of a of a duum vir uh, quinquennalis, which is a, the Roman magistrate of the colony. And it has the the initials DD, which means the Creator de Corionum, which means the local by decision of the local senate. Now these coins were first uh, first recorded by Sestini in the in the eighteenth century, who said that wandering around Macedonia, he, he found them. Such specimens were discovered between Pell and Dium. So let's say in between the colonies, Pell and Dium were both colonies, Roman colonies in Macedonia, not very far apart the one from the other. So Sestini said he had found them there in this region, and that because of the DD which we find on the coins of Dium. Um, he attributed these coins to the colony of Dium, although they don't have an ethnic, they don't have the name of the city, the name of the colony. Now, when I did my thesis many years ago on the coinage of Dium, I went through all the coins that were found in the excavations. And I found about 50 coins of Tiberius at the time of Dium, of the mint of Dium, and I found one or two coins of these. The coins of Tiberius had the main, the name of the of the of the city of the colony, so well my my assumption is that these are not coins of Dion because it's very very strange that we find so few of them because they're not so rare coins. So I believe they probably should be attributed to the mint of to the to the mint of Pella to the colony of Pella. But we need now to um, to confirm this through the. Archaeological material under the excavation of Pella. So these are just two examples through my personal research, but there are hundreds of others, of course, and uh, especially the two periods, of course, where um, uh, provenance is important for for um, for the identification of the mints. The first is the archaic period, where we very often have coins with no, with, well, off, always have coins with no ethnics, and we have very many unidentified issues, so their provenance are important. And the second period where we have very many coins with, with no um, ethnics is the period of the, um, of the late Republic. So if you look at Grant, the Book of Grant from period to, who, who actually discusses all these issues in the, the second half of the first century, let's say, these provincial issues, you see that there are numerous issues 
uh, with no ethnics and uh, there's a great discussion about their dating and especially uh, the sorry their 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 main their issuing authority so especially since these are bronze coins and those coins provenance is even more important than the silver ones so um now let's turn to it so okay provenance is important for identifying mints but in some cases provenances can offer more complicated let's say and more subtle uh, information concerning the function of coins or the function function of, of special issues so now i will turn back uh, to the ptolemies um, this is a portrait of ptolemy the third who was the the son of ptolemy the second he ruled uh, as you can see here in the third quarter of the third century and he continued the policy of his father which was um hostility to, towards the Antigonids, um, even after the, their defeat in the Cremonidium War. There's another, uh, there's another, there is another conflict, naval, uh, a naval conflict between Antigonus and Ptolemy, uh, and Ptolemy probably the third, um, at a naval battle of Andros, uh, an island in the Cyclades, although the date of this naval battle is not very securely established. But uh, we know it did, it, did, um, it did exist, it did happen. And um, we also know through various literary sources that uh, Ptolemy III continued to provide financial support to the enemies of the Macedonian in Greece. Aratos and their key, their key and League in the first place. And when they were obliged to take the part, uh, to go on the side of the Macedonians, continued um continued um uh supporting financially Cleomenes, the king of sparta who always remained an enemy of the macedonians um so if we look at um have a look at the bronze uh the bronze coins of ptolemy the third well the, the the pictures on the left uh show us what uh, bronze Ptolemaic bronze denominations look like. Um, they all have <clears throat> these apostroform bronze denominations. Earlier, the, 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 the image was a bit more varied, but doesn't change essentially. So here, what we have is the head of Zeus, Lord head of Zeus on the obverse, and the Ptolemaic eagle on the reverse on all denominations. And of course, we have, as is very characteristic, um, the Ptolemaic uh, coinage and economy, we have these very, very large bronze coins. You see here 90 grams, 40, 40, 45 grams, uh, 16 grams. All these denominations are totally unknown to Greek coinage. They're very specific in Egypt. But apart from these, we have a special series of bronze, of bronze issues of, uh, of Ptolemy III, which differ from the, the well-known um, um, Ptolemaic bronzes in various ways. And so these are the four denominations you can see on the right. Um, these were first identified by Zvoronos in his, in his book on the Ptolemaic coinage, and then they were taken over and discussed again by Lorba in her, in her recent book on Ptolemaic coinage, the first one. <clears throat> now, um, so What's the difference of these coins to the, to the Ptolemaic coins? Because they have the inscription Basim Beleus Ptolemeo on the reverse, as you can see here. So uh, the, first, the first difference is obviously an iconographic one. On the obverse, they do not have the head of Zeus, but they had the head of the, of the king, a diadem, a diadem portrait of, of Ptolemy. This is something that never occurs on Egyptian on Ptolemaic bronzes. On Ptolemaic, on genuine Ptolemaic coinage, um, we have portraits on the on the on the on the silver and the gold issues, but we never have the king's portrait on the bronze. Um, so this is the first difference. The second difference is that these are completely different denominations. These are these are much smaller coins. Uh, they fall into the they they fall into the uh, the general pattern of Greek coinage. <clears throat> They're much smaller and much lighter. 
and if you handle them, you can see that uh, they have nothing to do with these large coins. They are, just feel like Greek coins. Especially the, the, the first two larger denominations are quite rare. But the, second, the, 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 the two smaller ones, especially this B407 denomination, the smallest, is found in, in very large numbers. Sorry, and this is just a just a slide that shows comparison of the of the the genuine Ptolemaic coin and this Ptolemaic and, and, uh, and this Ptolemaic issue with uh, w which we were just discussing. Um, so, well, we have the specificity about these coins that they are never found in Egypt, and if we try to see where they are found, they are actually found mostly in the Peloponnese. And um, the red dots, <clears throat> the red dots depict hordes where these coins, these bronze coins were found, and the blue dots depict um, uh, isolated finds. So as you can see, all the hordes come from the Peloponnese. We have some isolated finds from Attica or from Delos, but the, the circulation is very, very regional. Um, so. So um, the first person to address this question was an ancient director of the Numismatic Museum in Athens, actually, um, Irini Varoucha Khristodoulopoulou, um, director in the 40s, let's say, 30s, 40s and 50s, um, who wrote a very interesting article, who first addressed the presence of Ptolemaic coins, not only these issues, but also the coins, the, the, the original, coins of Ptolemy II that I showed you before that are found in various regions in around the Greek world and the Aegean. And she also discussed these coins, um, put together all the known fine spots at the time. And then this discussion was again taken over by Katerina Chrysanthiki Nagel in a more much more recent uh, publication where she added new, new evidence concerning provenances. And all the new evidence actually corroborates what uh, Varuha had already um, seen that these have a very these coins have a very regional um, circulation. So um, the thing is now, how do we understand? How do we explain this phenomenon? So given the historical background I I, I, I described earlier, um, what Varuha actually suggested is that these bronze coins were actually the financial support that we know from the sources that Ptolemy um, gave to the Achaeans and later to the Spartans to support them in the war against the Macedonians, whatever. Well, this is certainly um, could be an explanation for these coins. Um, uh, Another explanation would be that has been put forward uh, another publication, but Celine Ipsoma, and has been also um, accepted by Lorber in her publication, in her book, uh, that these coins were um, actually produced in the Peloponnese, probably produced in Corinth. We have very, very many coins of this type found in Corinth and were used to pay the, the troops in in the the, the, the Ptolemaic troops um, in the region. Now, whatever the exact uh, the exact uh, the exact exp the exact um, interpretation of what the coins were used for, the, the important question I think is, who produced them? I mean, um, was it was it uh, the city of Corinth that produced these coins? Um, uh, Probably to pay to to pay Ptolemaic troops. I mean, why would they produce coins that they they had to they had to look like Ptolemaic coins? That means that they they had to be used by people that sort of understood these coins. So they were very very probably um, uh, produced um, for such a reason. And what is very interesting in my view concerning this coinage is, um, and they were most probably produced in Corinth, it would be much more absurd to say that they were produced in in Egypt and shipped over to, 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 to the Peloponnese, also this is not completely impossible, but and I think this is an issue 
where metal analysis uh, would be very interesting to to put forward and uh, to see what it would what it would give us. Um, and uh, a study of this sort has been put forward by Thomas Fauché and it concerning the Ptolemaic coins that were found in Sicily. But that's another question. But anyway, um, what's what for me is the most interesting, sorry, uh, the interesting issue from this coinage is that these coins are found in very large numbers. And uh, this is an example of a hoard which was recently published as an excavation hall from Dimi. Dimi is a, a Roman colony just outside Patras on the, also on the northern western part of the Peloponnese. And this is a hoard that dates to the, the second half of the first century BC, because these here, down here, these are coins of the colony of Dimi, which was a so short-living Caesarian uh, foundation that then was incorporated into into Patras, into the large colony of Patras. So we have these coins which belong to the, the, the 40s. And we have some coins, the bronze coins of Sicyon as well, which are somewhat earlier. And we also have a very large, well, not a very large number, we also have five coins of these Ptolemaic issues, which are much, much earlier and extremely worn. So what I can assume from all this picture is that these actual Ptolemaic coins were used in... Um, in the, in the Peloponnese, they were accepted in the circulation, although they were not produced, um, they did not have the name of a, a local issuing authority, they were accepted and they were used in the Peloponnese together with the local bronze coinages. I think we cannot doubt this after this evidence. And another similar, I will close this, um, this, uh, this, this discussion with a second similar similar case of bronze coins. Now we go and look at the thing from the Macedonian side. Um, so uh, this is Antigonus Gonatas, it's a nice um, uh, picture from a fresco on the 40s BC from uh, from the area around Naples that depicts Antigonus and his mother. And uh, so we Antigonus was the king that managed to consolidate after a very long and troubled period, the Antigone dynasty and establish control, as we always said, over Athens and several cities in the Peloponnese. The, 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 the silver coinage of Antigonus has been studied um, and has been published uh, recently um, in an ANS publication by Katerina Panagopoulou. So you all know, of course, these all were well-known tetradrachms of Antigonos. And what is important, what we know now is, we knew earlier from a long time actually, is that these coins in the name of Antigonos continue to be produced even after the death of Antigonos Gonatas. They, are, they also were posthumous coins. So um, now if we turn to the bronzes of Antigonos Gonatas, well, he produced um, coins of these three uh, three three series, three, three different types. The first type is a clearly Macedonian type, a traditional Macedonian. There's a Macedonian shield on the obverse with the monogram of the king. You don't have the name of the king here, but we have the monogram of the king, Alpha Nitafa, which certainly stands for Antigonos. And on the reverse, we have a helmet and the and the and the letters Basi, which stand for that is title Basileus. So this is a type that we have on Macedonian coiners since the time in bronze, since the time of Alexander III, the, 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 the Great. And what is very interesting about these, these, these bronze coins with the Macedonian types is that they're very, very rarely found outside Macedonia. Then we have other two types, two different series. Um, we have this series with the head of Athena on the obverse and the pan erecting a trophy on the reverse which is a completely new type, and Dionus introduced this type, and it's a clear uh, reference to his to his victory over the Galatian, uh, the Gauls, over the Gauls, excuse me. And then we have a second, uh, a third, a third uh, series with the head of Heracles and uh, a rider, which is also um, a, a well-known Macedonian type, a traditional Macedonian type. But the difference is that the, the, these two second series 
are found in extent in extremely large numbers um, in the south. So this is this is a, this is a map with um, the bronze with 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 uh, bronzes of Antigonus Gonatas that derive from burials from from graves. So what do we see here? We see something that is quite normal, something we expect to see. We see that most of the the bronzes of Antigonus Gonatas are found in in the, the area of his kingdom, with a very few exceptions of a coin in Locris, uh, in Kinos here in Locris, and Medeon here in Phokis. And we know that both these cities were Macedonian strongholds. They had Macedonian garrisons. So they were certainly Macedonian soldiers um, uh, whose tombs we have discovered containing the Macedonian coins. But if we look at the rest of the hordes, that contains coins of Antigonus that were not found in in burials, but were other kinds of emergency or other hordes. We see that the picture is much more widespread. We see that we have uh, the blue the blue dots here are coins of hordes uh, that date to the reign of Gonatas, and the red the red dots are coins are hordes that contain coins of Gonatas, but are of a later date. So here we see that we have a much more widespread um, distribution of these coins that are found in areas under Antigonid control, not only in the, the kingdom itself. And uh, there's a one very interesting hoard uh, that comes from uh, from uh, from Trapeza here, I think this one, this one yes, um, in the northern a Peloponnese is the only hoard that contains exclusively uh, Antigonid coins, no other coins, only the Antigonid coins. Whereas the others are more mixed hoards. Now, if we look at the, the coin finds from Athens, which have been very well published by, by Kroll many years ago, and we look at the Macedonian coinage that has been found at the Agora of Athens, what do we see? We see that we have a very, very large numbers of coins of Antigonus Gonatas compared to those of other of other kings, even of Alexander uh, the the third. You see, we have twenty two coins of Alexander the third, and we have over three fifty coins of Antigonus Gonatas. So there can be no doubt that this should be, um, and this that this is something to connect to the to the to the the establishment of the garrisons. In, uh, in Athens over uh, 30, 30, 40 years. And uh, so the, the, these coins were, um, were used uh, in Athens. There can be no doubt, I think, uh, from, this, from this general picture that these coins were not just lost over in Athens, but they were actually used in Athens. And this is not only the picture we have from the Agorites, we have it from other, other, other excavations around Attica. And the fact that the coins were used in Athens, I think, um, is corroborated, and not only in Athens, also in other areas under Antigonid control, is corroborated by the fact that we have overstrikes of these coins that date to a much later period. So we know that the Macedonians um, lose control of Athens in, and uh, large parts of the, the south and Greece in 229. And uh, we know also, and Kroll has shown this, that uh, these Athena brands, uh, pan bronzes, have been used as plans for the production of Athenian issues much later, which means that down to 229, these coins were actually around and that so they circulated. And exactly the same can be um, noted. And these, these overstrikes are extremely common. They're very, 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 um, they're found in very large numbers, especially the Thessalian one, the, the Theban, the Boeotian ones, excuse me. So um, uh, we have, so we what we do have in Boeotia is large hordes and very many number of the other type of um, bronze coins of, of Antigonos with the, the head of Heracles and the rider on the reverse that were later overstruck on these Persephone, Poseidon uh, bronzes, and they were turned into Boeotian coins. 
And this also there happens much later. So again, this is an indication, I think, um, that these bronzes um, were actually used in these areas. So just what I want to say is that in the Hellenistic period, we do have some exceptions to what we consider to, to, the, to the general rule that uh, bronze coinages are only accepted uh, in the in the the strict region uh, where where they were produced. Um, of course, this is not uh, this is this is this is an exceptional. These are exceptional issues that can be explained. But however, they do open uh, a new a new a new um, way of using coins. And I think I'll stop with this. And I thank you much, very much all for your patience. And I can stop sharing now. Yes, I think it's. Uh... Thank you very much for a great, really presentation. Fantastic, really. Um, now I'll uh, open now uh, the floor to uh, questions. Uh, I don't know if you, I, we have a few comments from uh, Daniel Wolf, Wolf saying that the Ptolemy the third coins on the left of the your slide are issues of Cyprus only. And then he said, I don't know if uh, Daniel wants to uh, speak up and, and uh, just tell these things with his own voice, what he wrote here. No? Okay, otherwise I, he says also nice to see that the Ptolemy Bronze Web site out illustrate your presentation. That's what he says. So, but anyway, so um, do we have any questions from the audience? Otherwise, uh, no? Okay, so, um, what I, among, among the very interesting things you said, I find uh, uh, most, uh, most interesting, perhaps uh, one of your uh, latest statement, uh, one of the, or the, the last statements of your presentation about uh, the possibility for bronze coinage uh, to circulate uh, my, much farther than the circulation radius that could be expected uh, now. So, of course, so my thing is that um, does this have to do, does it have to do with a standardization, let's say a sort of a beginning of standardization of these bronze coinages that would begin already in the third century uh, BC? Because, for example, I mean, there is clearly a huge difference between the standard, let's say, Ptolemaic coins issued by Ptolemy the uh, Third for Egypt, so the standard Ptolemaic ones, and the one and the ones that you have convincingly argued that were circulating for sure in Greece, but were perhaps produced there as well. Well, I think it's um. I, I don't know if if it's actually standard. I could use this word standardization. I think it's a very, it's. I think it's a very practical and realistic um. Uh, 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 how do you say? A result of um, of a strong um, royal power that extends um uh the kingdom itself i think, I it's think a, it's a very, very practical um fact uh, that they need to pay for example macedonians mm -hmm. uh, in all these garrisons and these people that there are very many you know the, the, i mean attica was overwhelmed with macedonian soldiers they had actually the whole region of piraeus was actually under macedonian control so all these people, they had to use some kind of coinage that they would uh, we would recognize in a sense. And what's interesting is that they are not using, they are of course probably also using the local coins, but um, 
they start also using uh, their their the, these uh, the, the, their own coins, um, and these gradually pass into the the local in the local circulation and probably would also be used by by the Athenians after for a while. I mean, if these coins turn up, we can't know for certain, but you know they will pro most probably accept it in the markets. So <clears throat> I don't know because about standardization because standardization concerns denominations and denominations in the bronze are a little bit you know obscure, and all these coins are very very similar. But it does show a difference in accepting in the in the sense of legal tender, I think, gradually. Yeah. I mean, it's like the cities, they lose part of their independence, political independence. And this has also some economic, uh, you know, um, results. Okay. No, not economic, but monetary. No, no, thank you. This is a great uh, yeah. answer. I mean, I know this is one of the most difficult problems. Perhaps. Yes, it is one of the most difficult problems. You're absolutely right, <laughs> Um Do we have any other questions uh, uh, from the audience? No, I don't see no other questions. Okay. Okay. Oh, no, yes. Uh, is there any recent update of excavations at Coroni? I mean, no, no I don't think there's this site has been excavated. No, it's just, no, I don't. But I think they're not now going to do, you know, I think this site is going to be um, sort of um, um, developed, as they say now. I think there's a program of development of this site, which is actually a very beautiful site because it's just on a beach. It's very nice. There's a there's a wonderful beach just below. So I imagine. I mean, they want to sort of, you know, um, and it's not nothing is built on this small peninsula, and you can actually virtually walk around it. So what they want to do is to make this more accessible to the public. So you know, they will make sort of paths and things like that. So I am sure that I guess that they will have to do some even small, you know, excavations to, to be able to sort of um, uh, transform this, uh, this area into a more um, accessible area. So I imagine they will find something, but it's not their, you know, their main scope to, to do a, a systematic excavation there. Right. No other questions, it uh, seems to me. So, uh, Sofia. Thank you. This was an incredibly uh, an exhaustive uh, presentation, and of course, it opens uh, it opens even more questions since now you have shown uh, as all good presentations should uh, should be doing. So it's now that you presented this idea of bronze circulating much wider than we would expect, so well, and. Uh, Thank you very much. And of course, we let you go back to your Friday evening at this point. Thank you very much. Really, <laughs> very much. And thank you very much, everybody, for being here. And uh, well, Thanks. thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>